Welcome to this video on otosclerosis. Before we begin, consider the following questions. What is otosclerosis? What structures can it affect? How does otosclerosis present? What is a Carhartt's notch and why does it occur? What are the key aspects of the history? What is the role of a CT scan? And how do we treat otosclerosis? Otosclerosis is osteodystrophy limited to the otic capsule. In this process, the normal dense bone of the otic capsule is first resorbed, leading to less dense or spongiotic areas before being replaced by more dense sclerotic foci. Therefore, both terms otospongiosis or otosclerosis can be used to describe this condition. By definition, the disease process only affects structures which are derived from the otic vesicle. As the malleus and incus are first branchial arch derivatives, and the stapy superstructure, aside from the footplate, is the second branchial arch derivative, these structures can never be the site of an otosclerotic focus. The footplate, however, has two different embryological origins. The tympanic surface is derived from the second branchial arch, whereas the vestibular surface is derived from the otic vesicle. Most commonly, an otosclerotic focus is found in an area just in front of the oval window known as the fissula antefinestrum. Depending on where the foci are found within the otic capsule, the disease may either cause a conductive hearing loss if it fixes the stapes footplate, a sensory hearing loss if it affects the inner ear, it may be asymptomatic if the foci are not affecting any parts of the otic capsule responsible for hearing. This is why we often see patients with a hearing loss on one side but completely normal hearing on the other side. And this is also why otosclerosis, although autosomic dominant, has an incomplete penetrance with variable expression. The classical type of hearing loss seen with otosclerosis is a conductive hearing loss with an artifactually reduced bone conduction threshold at 2 kHz known as Carhartt's notch. In order to understand the cause for the Carhartt's notch, we must first understand what resonant frequency means along with the mechanisms of normal bone conduction. Any object or system has a natural resonant frequency. This describes the frequency where the object or system vibrates at a higher amplitude. If you think of a singing bowl which vibrates at a certain frequency or pitch as friction is applied to its rim, the pitch corresponds to its resonant frequency. And the resonant frequency of the acicular chain is 2300 Hz or approximately 2 kHz. When a bone conductor oscillator is applied to the mastoid, the energy is conducted to the inner ear through three different routes. Firstly, directly through the temporal bone and into the otic capsule, known as compressive. Additionally, through conduction via the acicular chain, known as inertial. And thirdly, through the ear canal, across the tympanic membrane and across the acicular chain, known as tympanoacicular conduction. With fixation of the acicular chain, the second and third components of bone conduction are lost, resulting in reduced bone conduction. And the effect of this reduced bone conduction is most noticeable the frequencies closest to the resonant frequency of the acicular chain. Key aspects of the history include the onset, duration and progression of symptoms, along with otological symptoms that could suggest an alternative diagnosis, such as recurrent infections and otorrhea, which could suggest a perforation or chronic suppurativitis media, vertigo and pulsatile tinnitus, or Tullio's phenomenon, which could suggest superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Any history of previous ear surgery or family history of hearing loss. It's also important to determine the occupation of the patient to anticipate the impact of the hearing loss on their livelihoods, along with the potential impact of any complications of surgery, such as vertigo if they work at heights or taste disturbance if they work in catering. A clinical history typical of otosclerosis combined with normal otoscopic findings, characteristic audiometry results and absent stapedial reflexes is usually enough to confirm the diagnosis of otosclerosis. However, a CT may be considered if there are atypical elements of the history to confirm the diagnosis and rule out any alternatives. Treatment of otosclerosis includes air conduction hearing aids, stapy surgery or in far advanced cases potentially auditory implantation. Hearing aids offer a low-risk solution to hearing loss. However, patients may not appreciate the cosmesis of wearing these or they may find looking after them to be cumbersome. Stapy surgery involves removing the stapy superstructure 
making a hole into the fixed stapes footplate and placing a piston that connects the long process of the incus to the vestibule of the inner ear. This has a greater than 90% chance of success where the air bone gap is reduced to less than 10 decibels. The main risk of a dead ear is quoted at approximately 1%. Additional risks include facial weakness, taste disturbance, and dizziness, along with worsening tinnitus. In advanced cases of otosclerosis, where the organ of hearing has been affected, resulting in a sensory loss, some patients may benefit from consideration of a cochlear implant, should they meet the NICE criteria for this. Bone conduction implants can also be considered for patients who do not want stapy surgery, but cannot tolerate normal air conduction hearing aids. We hope you found this video to be useful. Leave us a suggestion on what to cover next.